So Jane James from Little Voices, welcome to the Disenfranchised. How are you doing? I'm good, thank you. Thank you for having me, Ed. It's really exciting. No problem at all. It's a, it's a pleasure to have you you with us and um, really looking forward to finding out a bit more about um, yourself and your, your business that you're running right now. So uh, before we go into all of that, though, I, like I always like to start, could you tell me what was your first job after education? Oh, first job after education. Well, whilst I was still in education, I worked at KFC. So I think that's an important one because it was a franchise itself. Um, and I was only 16 at the time and loved working at KFC, learning all the processes and systems and things. Um, but my first job after leaving full-time education was as a teacher in schools, um, teaching singing and music. So um, that's my background. I'm an opera singer by, by trade, really. Wow, fantastic. So I'm going to start with the KFC one. It it seems like it's it's supposed to be a job that everybody kind of just falls into, you know, and is easy and, and kind of bottom of the rung, a lot of people think. But how did you find to actually work in there in, inside? Was it a lot harder than you think? Um, there's, yeah, there's a lot to remember, a lot to do. My uncle actually owned um, several KFC shops, so that's how I got my my first job. Um, but I learned a lot. I learned a lot about teamwork, about everyone having a different role um, and, and, and that team really making, you know, excellence happen so that people got that food on time at the right temperature um, with all the right side orders, upselling. There were so many phrases that I learned um, through working in that in that role. It was really, really interesting. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? You, you don't think of it like that from the outside necessarily. I, I know kind of in, when I was younger, it was almost the, the job not to go for, but actually, yeah, I didn't think you actually learn a lot of terms in in, in being there and, and different approaches and different um, ways to work with other people. So yeah, it's a good to start regardless, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, now we have things like Trustpilot and, and review sites and, and things like that, but then they had mystery shoppers as well. So, so that was really interesting. You never knew which customer was actually checking you out and giving you a mark um, and, and keeping standards really, really high, you know, even down to the, the windows being washed and the right uniform being worn and, um, and and things that you were you were marked on as a team that actually some of the things you, you didn't have control over you just had to hope that the manager had got that in place that's interesting because I guess that's um KFC protecting their brand right and absolutely um, makes sense and explains why they're they're such a strong brand internationally you know because they've kept those standards really high and yeah and every every shop's doing the same thing every employee whatever role they're playing is doing their role to the best of their ability so it was it was a really interesting process to go through cool so you mentioned um your first job then was as a, a singing teacher but you was a, a an opera singer by by trade so t talk me through that how did you get into opera singing how did you <laughs> <laughs> how did you even find out you could sing like that yeah uh, so I've always sung um I had singing lessons from a really young age from being primary school age love to perform love to sing and my teacher opened me up to the world of opera and classical music, and it really suited my voice. So it's something that I went into and, and studied at university, music at university at Sheffield. And then I went and did a master's degree in concert singing and performance at the Scottish Academy of Music and Drama. And it was from there that you learned about the voice and all the different languages and all the different styles. Um, and that led me on to, to teaching youngsters when I left, left doing my, my master's degree. Perfect. So what was it about opera singing that, that attracted you to it? I mean, t typically people, when they're younger, they go for pop music or punk or something like this, you know, and, and start singing their favourite tunes. Yeah, opera's not a first choice for everybody, but for me, it just suited me. It suited my voice. I loved the um, the dresses. I loved the performance of it. Um, it's it, was, it just really touched me. And it was something that really suited my voice and, and me as a person. Perfect. And so were you performing at all or was that just kind of a hobby? Um, I did perform. I didn't do anything huge. I wasn't at the Royal Albert Hall or anything, although I would have loved to have been. Um, I did lots of concerts, lots of weddings, funerals um, and concerts that the, the, the university used to send us out to, to perform on their behalf. Um, I didn't really enjoy the auditioning process, which is why I didn't follow opera as a career. Um, I found it really stressful, um, really, really stressful in terms of getting a job, not getting a job, no, not having any feedback, um, 
the money, the no money. It was a really uncertain, unstable career. And it wasn't something that I wanted to follow long term. Teaching gave me a lot more stability. Okay. So is that the, the main reason you then turned to teaching? Or was there something else within the, the teaching world that it could offer you that you wanted in your career? Um, I think it was stability. And it was also the fact that I just loved teaching children and seeing them flourish. It was it just... It, it helped me to understand my voice more, understand me as a person more. Children gave so much back. They were like little sponges. They um, ad- absorbed everything that you were you were telling them. They looked up to you. They admired you. Um, and they were inspired by your voice and they wanted to do better. So um, it was something that I found really inspiring myself and, and just loved the teaching. Um, I'd got married at the time. So I was I was buying a house and I was settling down and, and you wanted that that stability really yeah it, it makes sense and um in in terms of the the age groups then how old were the, the children that you were teaching oh some t- children as young as five and six right up to 18 19 20 adults um there was lots of adults that came for singing lessons that wanted to improve their their voice um maybe had lessons when they were younger and had, had a gap um and wanted to just revisit that as a hobby um, and I did a lot of teaching from home, a lot of teaching in schools, a lot of teaching for other organisations. And I was just teaching every single day, seven days a week. OK, so it, it wasn't a case of you were you were just in a school with a you know, full time role. This was something that kind of incorporated a number of different avenues for you to, I guess, generate an income. Yeah, absolutely. L- lots of different schools that I worked in. Um, some m- longer than others. Some I'll do three days, some I'd do four days, and some it would be only a few hours. So you you were on the road quite a lot. Um, and it was it was all freelance. So everything was freelance that I did as the singing teacher. It wasn't that you were employed by the school to be there full time. Okay. So how how easy was it for you to pick up work at that time? Um Work came to me, Ed, honestly. That sounds sounds awful um, to say it, I suppose, but it was a reputation sort of went before me. So they knew that I was doing a good job and and parents spoke to other parents, schools spoke to other schools. um, And my old school took me on. So they already knew me as as an old girl, um, someone who had sung at school, got now got all the qualifications. And so they took me on. Um, so it was it was a case of reputation standing before you. Yeah, that's really good though, isn't it? Because obviously, then people are are talking about what you were doing in a positive way. You know, um, it's very easy just to disappear, especially if you're not advertising. But unless you've got that strong referral network, so you must have been doing something right. <laughs> to- well, I think you know when you're working with children, it's much more than just a singing lesson. It was much more than just a let's sing these songs it was you got to know the children you helped them with confidence you helped them to with their with their mindset with their approach to things they brought their problems to the to the teaching room um you became a bit of a counselor it was you know it was their time to sort of work on their voice but also have that relationship with their with their singing teacher yeah so was was this in in class time or was this um extracurricular kind of activities both so some schools would do it in the school day and then some it would be extracurricular after school hours okay cool and um are you you still doing that today what's (laughs) yeah something you've stepped away from a little bit i guess and we'll we'll come on to that but how how long were you you doing this uh, on a freelance basis um for a good couple of years maybe three four years um i was doing that for until my my uh, child came along And uh, it was when my daughter was three months old that we decided that, well, I decided I needed something even more stable, even more um, controllable, because obviously life was very hectic teaching six, seven days a week all over the place. And and that wasn't conducive to having having a child and a family. So so what did you think? Well, what was the solution? What did you find was the, the path forward for you? Um, well, I was sat around a coffee shop table um, in my hometown of Blackburn with a friend and colleague, and she just said, we should do something. We should start a business and we should teach children in groups and you do the singing and I'll do the drama and we'll call it Little Voices and we'll just start. And I was like, oh, I, I couldn't even, 
I couldn't see what she was saying because I was so busy. I was so tired. I had a three month old baby. Um, I was breastfeeding this baby. My husband had just left for someone else. Life was very hectic. Yeah. <laughs> um, and thinking about starting a business was, was, you know, the last thing on my radar. Um, and I said, when do you think when I, well, she said, when can you fit it in? What, what days do you have free? And I said, well, a Tuesday between five and seven, I literally have a, a gap. She said, great, we'll do it on a Tuesday, five till seven. We'll start next month. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. And honestly, that's how Little Voices was born. Um, we started the following month. She convinced me. We called it Little Voices. It started in a, a, a music room in a, a private centre that we hired. We had about 12 or 18 children, something around that number, less than 20 anyway, we started with. And, uh, and the rest is history, as they say. Yeah, so uh, for you, you, this this partner you started with, what was her background? Was it business or or, or drama? You said so. Drama. Her her background was drama teaching. So she was the co-founder of Little Voices with me. She's no longer involved in the business, but um, we separated when I went to start franchising. But um, she was a drama teacher, head of drama, and we've been friends for a long time. And she'd been one of my teachers at school. So she'd been my head of drama when I was at school. And that was our connection. Um, And she had this love of drama and I had this love of music. And and together was how we started the business. So that's pretty brave of you to not necessarily working in a a corporate environment or having built sort of businesses from scratch before to to say, right, that's it. We're actually going to going to start something and, and and have some ambitious plans around it. I know you kind of got dragged into it a little bit, but still, you know, you didn't have to turn up and, and, and run the classes. So how did you find that um, starting a business? Like what, you know, after, after once you've got going? Um, I loved it. I absolutely loved business. Um, and I think my business background in terms of my family, they'd always been in business. Um, something inside of me just was like, wow, this is where I'm supposed to be. Um, it just it just made sense. So I'd followed my heart in terms of my education, doing music and, and singing and following my love and my passion. But I hadn't taken it to the full level of performing on stage and auditioning and taking it all the way to being an opera singer. This business side of it mixed with the music, with the with the drama and the and the performance it just really made sense to me. Um, and it was easy. It was, it came naturally. Um, I, I just, I loved every element of it. I loved policy and procedure, finance, marketing, sales, relationships, all of those things, just whatever I touched, I sort of, Oh, I'm, I enjoyed it. So it wasn't so hard. And it, and I think that's where the, the, the dreams to build the business um, and, and grow it really came from because I I was loving what I was doing. Yeah, that's that's really good. So, was there anything that you found particularly challenging? Um, challenging. I mean, at that time, we didn't have any complaints. When it was really small, and it was just me and um, my ex business partner, we were doing everything. We were on the ground, so we didn't have complaints. But as it grew a little bit, and we took on staff. And we'd had little, we'll have little niggles, shall we say, from parents or um, something wasn't going right with a venue. Or I found that and the confrontation of it really quite challenging. I, f- I found that difficult. And I think I still find that difficult even today. Um, I like everyone to be happy and I like everything to be running smoothly and, and no problems. But, you know, we don't live in a perfect world, do we? No, um, <laughs> no not at all. And- <laughs> It's it, it's more about how you overcome those challenges, isn't it, right? So how do you deal with those complaints that, that makes, uh, you, well, makes or breaks a business, really? Because as you said already, you know, your your freelance kind of career was was built on word of mouth and, and shows you how powerful it can be, really, that word of mouth. So, yeah, dealing with those complaints whilst challenging, I guess, is really important. Absolutely. And I think it's really important. And I've always said this, I say it to my franchisees now, I say it to to my own daughter, whenever someone's got a problem, just listen, 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 and keep listening, because that will give you so much information to be able to understand it from someone else's point of view. Um, 
because we're not always right and we can't always bulldoze in there with with the answer um so yeah you've got to you've got to be really really patient and a really good listener yeah yeah definitely so 14 years now um little voices have been running for about 14 years isn't it so that's right how how long was it before you you decided to to franchise the the business it was about four, four or five years until we franchised the business. Um, we'd got to a size where we had quite a lot of tutors working for us and they were delivering sessions in different areas. And I just drove home one night. It was dark. It was miserable. It was a no- November evening, I think. And I just thought, wow, we could, we could have lessons and access and help children all over the country every night of the week multiple classes like we just need to find a system that that helps us to grow to that stage um and as i did more and more research it was franchising that seemed to be the 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 the, the framework that we needed to be able to to grow and expand and um and that's when i took it to my business partner and said i, I want to franchise i want to borrow a whole host of money and i want to build the brand re- even stronger and and help others to do what we're doing join our family um she didn't want to do that at that time it wasn't the right time for her um i was willing to keep getting rid of jobs that i'd picked up i was getting rid of them one by one until i could do full time what i wanted to do um and she wasn't in that position so we we split at that point and i did go on to borrow a whole host of money and and um and risk everything i risked everything um, to build little voices. Wow. So the, the drive to do that must have been strong then really, because in, in some ways, maybe you could just keep on employing tutors and different locations and, and manage them that way. So um, what, what was driving you to, to, to do it down that franchising route? Um, to build a network, to find other people who I knew that it couldn't just be tutor, 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 because tutors there was quite a high turnover of tutors so we would you know tutors would go on and do other things a bit like I was I I tutored for all those years and then I was moving on and good tutors move on to find something more stable I wanted people like me really that wanted to own and run their own business and build their own team of tutors um and and build their own stability so people with a similar background perhaps to myself that had done a music degree or drama degree who had been teaching for a number of years across many different sectors and were looking for something more, a challenge, but something more stable. Um, and that that was franchising. That was, you know, looking for franchisees, looking for, we call them principals in our network, but looking for a principal to run their own, their own locations. Okay, so that stability <laughs> part is actually really important, isn't it, when you you think about it for 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 you and for the brand and for the people that are joining it's it's taken away that kind of i guess i guess with tutoring there's this income that goes up and down right but yeah you get, you get a job and it's great and then you have to go and find another one and then it, it may, maybe there's a, a few weeks or months where there's there's not the same level of income so having a business that yeah you, you can almost have that reliable income um provides that stability for for four people or for the certainly your franchise partners so I, I wanted to ask about your your franchise partners and, and what what is it they actually do then so are they tutors themselves do they get involved in teaching or are they they just managing the operations how, how does it work and um, we have both actually in our network so we have some um franchisees that just run the centers and and employ tutors to work for them and they just manage and they do all the administration and the the finance and the marketing and and the sales side of things but we have um the vast majority of our franchisees who teach as well who still want to teach the lessons and they also manage so they wear both hats and and it's possible to do both it's 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 flexible enough to do that um and it d- just depends on the individual how big they want to grow their business, um, and what their what their passion is really, where where they want where they see themselves. I still run my own franchise, 
Um, and although I don't teach every single week, there are weeks when I get called in to go and cover or, or to teach. And, and I love that. I love going in and, and teaching. So there is that flexibility for me still to be on the ground, which is which is lovely. And that's possible for our franchisees as well. Perfect. So do you do your franchisees need to be um, singing teachers previously or what kind of background do you generally look for? Yeah, we look for those with a, a singing or drama performing arts background, um, a degree in performing arts or drama or music um, and tend to have worked professionally or um, worked in teaching one or the other. That seems to be the background that is attracted to us. Um, you know, then we've got other franchisees, you know, it's not unheard of where we've got someone with a sales and marketing background or a finance background um, or sometimes a duo of, you know, husband and wife team or, um, you know, partners who want to go into this and one's the sort of financy managerial side and one's the creative um, teaching side. So um, it, it's horses for courses and, and, it, and it's, so we take it on each individual and merit really on, on who comes to us. Yeah, I guess the the passion for for teaching children those has got to be there, right? Because otherwise, uh, yeah, <laughs> it, it, it's not all about the money in this kind of environment, is it? Obviously, it's important part for for everybody. But like you did, you you've got to enjoy what you're doing and 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 have a passion for it. So, I think that's probably absolutely too, right? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so uh, over the the fourteen years that you've been running, then um, you've obviously now supported a number of people to to build out their own franchise business. H- how many is it to this state? Do you have any? Um, Twenty twenty seven. Twenty seven. Okay, so what ha- what have you learned personally from that process of supporting other people to set up their their own business? Wow, everyone's different. <laughs> <laughs> everyone's different. Everyone's got. Um, their strengths and their weaknesses and helping you know to plug the gap with support where people feel um, less sure a little bit weaker in certain areas of of running a business that's where we need to step in and give more support Um, you know those that come to us with a sort of managerial teaching background might not necessarily have the the sales and marketing background or someone with a um, finance background doesn't have the teaching background so we, we get we have to tailor our support really specifically um and you learn so much about people I've got to say you know through the pandemic and, and through this last 18 months I mean that's that really shows the strength of, of your network and and the power of your company you know we're still here to tell the tale which is amazing um but you know we've learned so much about working together as a team as a network together as well pulling on the strengths of each other um that's that's really really you know really important and really fantastic so oh gosh i've learned so much so much <laughs> could write a book <laughs> yeah that that collaboration piece between franchise partners i think um people that haven't been in the franchising industry or, or haven't kind of investigated it properly i don't realize how much collaboration there is you know it, it, it's really nice to have that support network because um your franchisees are going to face challenges in their early days certainly it doesn't matter <laughs> how yeah. you put it out there out there it's it's what's going to happen it's starting a business there's always a mm-hmm. challenge somewhere um but having people in that network who have been through it before and can help you through and explain to you look don't worry just keep going this this is pretty normal you you know it's not going to be the end this is what happens it can be really reassuring and help people get through those dark times i appreciate that's what you you're going to be doing as a franchise or yourself but Mm -hmm. having other people to to talk with as well is really important as well so um Obviously, during COVID, then you guys were were, were pretty resilient. Um, you know, not having face to face classes anymore, having to to transition online, you know, must have been a, a moment of panic and, and challenge. But for for sort of future, um, you know, nationwide or, or global events like this, you feel a little bit more prepared this time around. And and what how did how different does your business look now to what it was pre COVID? Yeah, I, I mean. It just resilient, just resilience is, is what's kicked in really over the last uh, 18 months. And um, the business is 
it's got more avenues now. We can do online lessons. We can, you know, when when children are self isolating, they can still um, link into the lesson and, and take part in that lesson. And and we've learned so many skills as franchisees and and franchise and the franchisor on um, you know on running businesses. And we can deal with a crisis. It was a big, big immediate urgent crisis and we've dealt with that so crisis management plans you know I've never even written one before (laughs) um but you know we did a crisis management plan and we followed it and we're now in you know recovery stage so um it's it's amazing really that that when you look back we've learned so much and the business has developed so much and we've got options available to us now that we didn't have pre-covid um and you've got to look at it like that because if you look at it in any other way you, it it becomes quite quite depressing <laughs> yeah. um but but ultimately we you know every every one of my businesses is still here to tell the tale um you know we did lose a couple but i think perhaps they were um only young or not quite got their anchors in place beforehand you know um and 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 that's really sad. And those those people have gone on to do other things. But um, ultimately, the, the the main cohort of the business has has, has maintained. Yeah, that's really good. I'm, I think um, you know the, the the pandemic has been something that's just completely unique in most people's lives. So um, emotionally, it's challenging as well as you know financially. Um, so it's no surprise that, you know, maybe there are one or two people that look for a different route and, and find a different kind of stability for themselves. You know, it's um, like you said earlier, everybody's different. Everybody's got their own um, things going on in their world, their own experiences that they, they, they lean on and base their decisions on, I guess, ultimately. So it's no surprise, but it's, you know, it, it could have been very easy. And I expect there's a lot of businesses out there in the, the similar world as yours that have just shut down now because they couldn't yep. cope, they couldn't find a way through. And um, I think that's, that shows a really strong culture where you can come together with, you know, your franchisees and, and find solutions that suit um, the, the current situation or the, the current challenges that you're facing. So would you say that um, you still have the same passion for your business that you, you did 14 years ago? Because, you know, that's quite a long time to be, you know, in it ultimately the same role for anybody if they're in, in like a, a traditional career. Um, mm. But yeah, running the business, you know, some people might be moving on from their businesses after five years or 10 years. So 14 years is quite a time. So do you still feel a passion for it? Every day, absolutely every day. I, I absolutely love what we stand for. I love what we do. I love how we help children, children ac- across the country are just still sponges, still wanting to learn, still wanting to develop. They look up to their teachers and the fact that we're able to give them so much confidence, give them, help them with their talent, help them with their mindset, help them with their mental health. It's, it's, a, it's an absolute privilege. It's an honor to do what we do every day. And I, you know, it brings tears to my eyes. I love what I do. And, you know, I couldn't do it if I didn't, you couldn't do it if I didn't. Um, I think, you know, one of the, the biggest things I would say to anyone considering a franchise or, you know, looking at, at changing their career path is do something that you absolutely love because there's that saying, if you do what you love, you'll never work a day in your life. And it, it's, I don't feel like this is work a lot of the time. Um, don't get me wrong. <laughs> We've just launched a new website and, and technology is not the thing that I like at all. And that's been really quite painful, quite stressful. And and I've sat there with my head in my hands sometimes thinking, I'm a singing teacher. I'm a singer. I didn't set out to build websites, (laughs) Um, but we've got through it. And, you know, the the end product is, is really good and I'm really pleased with it. And we're now streamlined and automated and um, ready for the next, next century to, to hit. So we're, you know, future proofed really. Cool. So uh, with with that, then your roles obviously changed really since you started Little Voices going out there doing the classes yourself. And now you're doing more of the kind of back office side of things, I guess. Yeah. Um, uh, what, what parts are you finding that you enjoy now at being a franchisor? Being a franchisor, I love speaking to um, our franchisees. 
I love supporting them. I love our symposium that we do every year, our national conference and our um, hubs that we do every month. I absolutely love presenting and, and facilitating those. Um, I look for the best in, in every situation and every person. So I also love speaking to our new potential franchisees or people considering um, looking at a franchise, um, of which at the moment there seems to be loads because people are looking for a different path. Um, and so those are the things I absolutely adore about the role. The things I don't enjoy, <laughs> should we go on to those? Yeah, yeah, let's do it. <laughs> um, the technology, can't stand it. <laughs> <laughs> um technology is just systems processes um procedures detail the heavy detail of anything um the contractual side of things that's why i've got a really good lawyer and a really good accountant and a really good support team to deal with those things that i don't don't like and perhaps i'm not best place doing anymore um i still love teaching i still love working and, and training our franchisees um, and our children. Yeah, it's, it's a really versatile role I've got now and it's it's a pleasurable one. Yeah, that's good. It keeps it, it keeps it exciting, I guess, and keeps you challenged every day anyway. So y- you mentioned there that a lot of people are, are looking at the moment or, or, or you know, thinking about setting up their own businesses and I'm guessing you're getting quite a few inquiries. Why, why do you think that is? Why right now? Um, I think it's quite scary for people going back into the workplace, back into their roles that they've been involved in through the pandemic, and they're looking for something different, maybe something that keeps them working from home a bit more because they've enjoyed working from home or um, something that gives them a little bit more flexibility or freedom to pick up the children from school and to have the children with them. And and actually the fact that we're now going back into more normal way of living, certainly from September, I think we should be be getting back there. Um, People don't want necessarily that nine to five office based um, back to the normal grind really. Um, because they've had a taste of what it can be like to home work and, and, and they want something that's maybe a little bit more flexible. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think that's right. I think um, there's, there's some people saying out there that there's this counter wave though of people now working from home for a bit too long and realizing actually <laughs> they need more people around them. So um, for, for those people then that are perhaps out there thinking about, you know, starting their own business why, why do you think um, the franchise model should be an option they, they consider? Um, but two reasons. One, I think that you're going into something that's a little bit more secure than setting up on your own. Certainly if you, you talk to the banks or people who lend funds or funds or money to, to start a franchise, they'd say that nine in 10 um, new startups fail whereas only one in 10 franchise businesses fail. And I think that's because you're surrounded by support. So that would be my second thing. The the support that is around you, you're still running your own business. You're still captain of your own ship. It's still your own bank account that you've got to fill with money and bring in those students. But, But ultimately you've got support around you from the franchise network, but also the head office team. Um, so captain of your own ship, but never alone. And, and that's, that's really appealing because it's just that it's standing on your own two feet, running your own business, but not on your own. So before you did all your, your research and investigated franchising, um, do you think you would have brought a franchise? Yes, I think I would. <laughs> <laughs> and I think it would have been a lot easier um, because I would have just been running my own business with, with a, a support network around me. I, I didn't do the, I researched the franchise system and how to, you know, legally and accounting wise set up a franchise, but I didn't actually look into the other franchise networks that were already out there. And that was a massive mistake with hindsight because there's some fantastic networks out there in my arena that I would have, you know, probably loved to be part of. And they could have done the technology bit for you. Yeah, they could have dealt with the headaches. <laughs> Excellent. So uh, you mentioned quite a few different brands then in in that in that um, in the space that you're operating in. What kind of how can you kind of differentiate against some of those brands? 
especially if uh, somebody's looking to buy into little voices or, or another brand or whatever it is how can they kind of figure out which is the the right brand for them how can you differentiate yourselves and show people that first of all i would say they've got to follow the heart so what feels right i'm a great believer in 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 all of that um fate and um you know being in the right place at the right time and you've got to go with your heart for for which brand feels like you can make it your own it's got to run through your blood um in terms of what makes us different um our, our classes are really small so our children there's only eight children in a class so that's really really different because you know lots of classes are 15 20 25 30 children even a child at school is in a class of 30 um, we pride ourselves on individual attention to each child um, so they can make really good friendships and they can still do group pieces of, of acting and musical theatre, but they they are in a really small, tight group, which helps to build their confidence. Um, it works both ways. It means then also that we we put all of our children through an exam system, which is not scary. It's really really fun um but a child can build their cv from a really young age by doing the exams with us so we work with lambda um one of our big partners um and we put every child through the exam system so they're building their cv and 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 that again is is something a little bit different cool interesting yeah so it's it's something that i think when i first looked at the franchising industry i was like okay box them off into the same kind of brand over the same kind of thing over there and um, never kind of really got into the detail of, of each and every one until I start to to do this podcast and meet people. And you can see actually I, I connect better with other people. And, and actually they're probably the ones that if I was to buy into a, a, a franchise brand within that particular sector, I'd go towards the people that I, I think I could get on with better. You know, I think yeah, it's as simple yeah. as that. Like you say, it's just the gut feeling of actually, I think this is the one, you know, um, you probably hold the same values as them and they're likely to, to be more more able to support you um, if 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 your if your thoughts and feelings are aligned, I guess. I think it's. I mean, many of my franchise or friends will say that franchising is like a marriage. So you've got to go through the dating stage, and you, we date loads of different people in life, and we find out all the little nuances, and and that dating process is really important in franchising. So look at all of them. I say look at all the people in the same sector. And, and do the dating process, you know, talk to their other franchisees, meet their friends and family, meet, you know, that's what we do in the dating process. And I think it's really important because you're going to go into a franchise agreement, which is a marriage contract, and you want that marriage to grow and last and develop. Um, and I really pride myself on that. I've only had two franchisees in my history that have left and not renewed. Everybody else has renewed at the five-year point. Um, and I want that. I want longevity. So it's important that at the very, very beginning, the franchise, potential franchisee chooses and the franchisor chooses the right, the right partner. Yeah. And it's a lot of that's down to culture, I would say, as to why you're having that, that kind of people rebuying or renewing their license, because yeah, if they, if they could stick it out and, and earn the money and, and then move on, couldn't they? But if they're, they're renewing, that's a really good sign I'd say for, for people to look out for. So I got a few questions I wanted to ask you um, on well, top of this. So, in terms of your 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 time as a, a singing teacher and then as a franchisor, have you had any good, uh, funny, or interesting or weird stories that you'd be happy to share with us? A weird story. I was thinking about this, and I think there's nothing more weird than me being sat on the side of a motorway slip road singing Nessun Dorma. <laughs> <laughs> Why were you doing that? <laughs> it's, well, it's quite it's quite sad in a way, but um, we were driving to school, my daughter and I, and um, we approached this slip road to get onto the M6, and a, a cy- the, the car in front of us knocked over this cyclist on the slip road as he was crossing over the, slip, the motorway slip road before we were to, to go onto the motorway, and he knocked this cyclist off, and I saw it all happen, this cyclist fly in the air and drop to the floor, and I thought, oh my gosh, we've got head injuries or, or whatever, and... I'm obviously uh, first aid trained with the with the business. We make everybody as a franchisee be first aid trained. Um, and so I pulled over. It's rush hour traffic first thing in the morning, go over to the casualty. 
I'm the first there ringing the 999. Oh, it was, it was chaos. It was absolute chaos. But once we'd got everyone on the way to us, I was sat with the casualty talking, trying to talk to him and find out about him and his name and everything. And, and, he, and I said, he said, tell me about you, talk to me about you. So I was saying, well, I was an opera singer and, and I could sing Ness and Dorma. He said, that's my favourite song. So next news, I burst into song singing Ness and Dorma on the motorway slip road with then all the emergency services starting to arrive and <laughs> me singing. Um, but it was the only thing to keep him, keep him focused and, you know, keep him lucid, really. They must have thought you was crazy. Like, yeah, crazy. <laughs> there's a man on the floor like, injured, and you, you're just singing at him. <laughs> I know, I know. And and the, one of the other guys who'd also stopped was like, "Well, she's got a pair of lungs on her," and you know, <laughs> with my northern accent now, you can't you can't tell, but the, there is a voice in there. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. And in in terms of. Um, other moments in your in your your kind of life and career what's been kind of inspirational or proud moment for you proud moment um was winning inspirational woman in franchising at a big award ceremony um in london with ewif um i was there with my husband there was quite a lot of our franchisees there there was a lot of other franchisors very prolific franchisors in the audience and up for the award and to win that um i think it was 2019 um, trying to look for the certificate on the wall, um, 2018 or 2019, I think it was. Um, and it was, it was just a really proud moment. It, it just, everything pulled together, inspirational woman in franchising. It just, it was amazing. Um, but I can all, only have done that through being surrounded by such amazing franchisors from other networks. So we talked about competitors before or, or people in the same spectrum, same sector. Um, and, they're, a lot of them are, are friends of mine and um, I'm proud of that. And we help each other and we support each other. And I think that's really important. And, and a lot of other franchisors have really inspired me and inspire me to, to be the best I can be really every day. So, you know, I'm lucky to be connected to those people. Yeah, that's really cool. You'd imagine from the outside, it's a competitive world, right? There's only so much time parents and kids have to take their, their, their kids to clubs. I know, you know, you could spend up all your evenings and afternoons taking the kids to the club so, <laughs> and weekends as well. I know my 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 two are, are, are doing lots of different things at the moment, but um, yeah, to, to see that you're all sort of helping and supporting each other is it's a really great thing. And I'm not too not sure how many other worlds that's happening in. You know, um, I think it's that franchise connection, isn't it? They but they know yes. that you've been going through those same challenges. It's a, a real support network, even for the the franchisors which is really great to see and, um, and, and and i was going to ask you um what was your your kind of one key piece of advice that you give to anybody thinking about joining franchising but i think we've covered it already it's it's do yeah, something that you love heart. right <laughs> yeah absolutely do what you love and follow your heart and you'll just know it's like buying a house you'll just go in there and you'll just know that's the one for you or meeting your life partner yeah this just works this is the right thing um, and I think you'll know that and, and you'll know it quite quickly. Um, you know, you don't need to spend weeks and weeks and months and months making making decision. You'll, you'll know a gut feeling and I think you should go with that. That's a really imp important point, actually. Um, I think if it's taken six months to, to make a decision, it's probably the wrong decision, right, for anything yeah. in life. <laughs> yeah, definitely. <laughs> and especially if you're going to buy into a licence, yeah, I, I think it's... It's probably too long, unless there's some really sort of extenuating circumstances or you've got a project that needs finishing. That's that's different. That's but different. The decision should already have been made in your mind, really, shouldn't it? So Absolutely. Yeah, really Absolutely. Awesome. Well, Jane, thank you so much for um, sharing your story with us and for sharing your insights. It's been really lovely getting to know you better and um, to hear all of those stories. So thank you for joining us on The Disenfranchised. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me, Ed. No worries. Take care. Take care. Bye. Bye.